Hey friends, so the concept of x-ray attenuation is literally core to what we do. And although the idea is simple enough, it can cause some confusion. So in this video, I'm going to explain what x-ray attenuation is in detail, as suggested by Khan in one of my earlier videos. So as a reminder, if there's something that you want me to cover, and it's within my understanding, then I'll deliver. Even though it may take a minute. Anyway, so the basic idea of x-ray attenuation is that when an x-ray, or a gamma ray for that matter, strikes a material, which could be an object or anatomy, there are three possible outcomes. The photon is either one, absorbed, that is, all of its energy is transferred to the atoms of the target material in one or more of the interactions. Two, it could be scattered in one or more interactions. Or three, it could traverse the material without any interactions, which means it will just kind of go through and avoid any physical touch. Now, if the photon is absorbed or scattered, aka the first or second option, then we say that it's been attenuated. That, in a nutshell, is what X-ray attenuation means. The reduction of the intensity of an X-ray beam as it traverses metal. So as an example, if we have a thousand photons that hit the material, and let's say 200 of them are scattered, and 100 of them are absorbed, then we say 300 have been attenuated from the original beam, and the other 700 have just traversed the material without any interaction. So therefore, we can say that the number of photons that are attenuated in a medium really depends on the number that traverse and go through the medium. And that logically makes sense, right? Essentially, if we know that 700 went through and we know that the original beam had 1,000 photons, then obviously 300 were attenuated. Okay, cool, we got that. Now, if the photons had the same energy, that is, the beam was monoenergetic, mono being one of the same and energetic, you know, just energy, so if the beam was monoenergetic, and if the photons were attenuated under good geometric conditions, which is the idea that the beam is narrow and is transmitted without any scattered photons, then the number of photons penetrating a thin slab of material with a thickness of x would be given by the following formula. Where I0 is the number of photons in the beam before the interaction, you know, before the thin slab has been placed into position, E is just a constant, and mu is the attenuation coefficient of that medium, and x is just the thickness of that slab. And the number of photons ultimately attenuated, aka stopped or reduced in energy, would be given by this formula, where IAT is the number of photons attenuated, hence the AT, I0 is the number of photons you initially started with, and I itself is the number of photons that went through, aka the ones that penetrated the material. So basically think of it as the number of photons you started with minus the number of photons that went through leaves you with the number of photons that didn't make it through, i.e. the photons that were attenuated. Make sense? And you just reply i in the formula from the before and do some math to extract the common values from each and you end up with this. So again, thinking of our original example, i0 is like a thousand. I would be 700 that went through, and the IAT attenuated is the 300 photons that were attenuated. See, it's all quite simple when you think of it in basic terms, because sometimes formulas can get scary, but the math is just a notational method of communicating what's going on, that's all. Oh, by the way, the exponent of E has no units, so therefore the units of mu is just one over centimeters, if the thickness of X is also expressed in centimeters. So that way the units cancel out and you're just left with a pure number that is the number of photons. And so an attenuation coefficient with the units of one over some length is called the linear attenuation coefficient. Now the X in the formula is referred to as the mean path length, which is the average distance traveled by the X-rays before it interacts with anything. And it's given by one over mu, where again, mu is the linear attenuation coefficient. And this makes sense, right? Because we said that mu itself has a unit of one over centimeters, for example. So if you just swap it them out mathematically, you get centimeters on its own, which is just the path length. And by the way, this is sometimes also called the mean free path or the relaxation length. Now the probability of a photon going through a slab of some thickness x without interacting with it is given by this probability portion of the formula from earlier. Now this probability portion of e to the power of negative mu x is actually a product of the number of probabilities that the photon doesn't interact with any of the five possible x-ray processes, that is x-ray interactions. And here's how it's expressed, where each of these symbols represents the attenuation process. So we have coherent scattering, aka elastic or Rayleigh scattering, the photoelectric absorption, Compton scatter, pair production, and photodisintegration. 
Now, the two most relevant for medical imaging are photoelectric absorption and Compton scatter which I've actually made separate videos for where I go into more depth about what they are and how they contribute to the final image. And I'll leave a link to those down below. And so coherent scatter, pair production and photo disintegration are all negligible factors, meaning they're so small, they're not even taken into account. And so mu is just written as tau plus sigma. Also, another important point to take into consideration is that attenuation coefficients are not only dependent on X-ray or gamma ray energy, but also the atomic number and therefore the density of the absorbing material, which is given by the symbol rho. So going from linear attenuation coefficient to mass attenuation coefficient, you just divide mu by rho, the mass density value. Okay, so these were the general concepts for the attenuation of X-ray and also gamma ray radiation. But now let's talk about their actual interactions in the body, that is the X-ray attenuation in tissues. So think about it. The human body is made up of what kind of tissues? It's broadly a mixture of fat, muscle, and bone. And of course, there's also air in the body in places such as the lungs or the sinuses, but and also in your bowels, particularly if there's a blockage somewhere. And sometimes in order to see and distinguish the tissues better, we introduce contrast in the body, which is usually iodine based. And so here's a table that summarizes the percentage mass composition for the different tissues in our bodies. And also in this other table, it's showing the effective atomic number, the mass density, and the electron density of those materials. You'll see why these are relevant in a minute. And by the way, these are coming from the Medical Imaging Physics textbook by William R. Hendy, uh, which is a fantastic resource and I'll link that down below for you. So as you can see in this table 7.1, fat or rather adipose tissue has a greater concentration of low Z elements, in particular hydrogen, where Z is referring to the atomic number that is the number of protons in the atom and what determines where it's located on the periodic table. So a low Z element is literally referring to a chemical element with a low atomic number. So anyway, because of this, fat has a lower density and effective atomic number when compared to muscle or other soft tissues, for example. Now, what's interesting about that is that below about 35 kbp, which is a relatively low energy for x-rays, the x-ray interaction with fat and soft tissues are mainly dominated by photoelectric interactions compared to Compton scatter, for example. And the interesting thing about that is that the likelihood of photoelectric interactions occurring is highly dependent on the atomic number, or Z, of the elements in that tissue. In fact, the probability is proportional to the cube of the atomic number, i.e. Z cubed, which means that even small differences in atomic number can lead to significant differences in how the X-rays are absorbed and therefore how your image looks which when you think about it, is results in an image that has more contrast, because contrast is all about being able to better differentiate between the different densities in the body. But this contrast disappears when we're dealing with higher energy x-rays that are then primarily interacting with Compton interactions. Since these interactions don't really vary with the atomic number, so essentially what we can say is that low energy x-rays are used to accentuate the subtle differences in soft tissue. So for example, in mammography, where the anatomy, aka the breast in this case, has little intrinsic density and therefore contrast itself. And it really helps to take advantage of the photoelectric interactions that dominate the lower x-ray energy spectrum. As in mammography, they usually use anywhere from about 27 to about 31, 32 kvp, which is definitely on the lower end, relatively speaking. And then on the other side of the spectrum, when we're dealing with an area of high intrinsic contrast, such as the chest, where you have bone, soft tissue, and air, then that's where you want to use your higher energy x-rays, which again, when you think about your chest exposures, it ranges anywhere from about 100 to 125 kvp, depending on the machine. Again, going back to this table, we can see that when compared with muscle and bone, fat does have a higher concentration of hydrogens and carbons at 11.2 and 57.3% respectively. A lot lower concentration of nitrogen and oxygen at 1.1 and 30.3% respectively, again when compared to other tissue types. And so as a result, the effective atomic number of fat is between 5.9 and 6.3 and as it states in the second table which is less than that of soft tissue at 7.4. And of course, of that of bone, which is between 11.6 and 13.8. Now, when we're dealing with higher energy X-rays that, as you know, are primarily interacting with the Compton scattering, the probability of interactions in this case don't vary with the atomic number, but with the electron density and the attenuating material, or rather the tissue. 
And what's interesting is that the electron density of hydrogen is about twice that of other elements. And so because there's more hydrogen in fat than in other tissues, there's actually more Compton interactions in fat than in equal masses of bone or muscle. Hydrogen, however, is absent from air because, you know, it's made up of oxygen and nitrogen. But it does contribute about 10% of the weight of muscle, which is actually the reason why electron density is greater for muscle than it is for air. Now, when thinking about how well a material attenuates photons, what can we say? Well, with fat, for example, because it has a lower effective atomic number, the low energy photons are attenuated less rapidly in it than in an equal mass of soft tissue or bone. Which basically means that because the atomic number on average is lower, there isn't as much stuff for the photons to interact with, and as a result, there's less photons stopped by or reduced in energy. Whereas when you look at bone, it has an effective atomic number or physical density that's greater compared to soft tissue. So we can say that x-rays are attenuated more rapidly in bone than in equal volumes of soft tissue. What about energy absorption in bone? Well, when compared to muscle or fat, bone actually has less hydrogen and as a result, its electron density is lower as well at about 3 to 3.1 times 10 to the 26. Because remember what we said earlier that hydrogen has about twice the electron density. And it's for this reason that the energy absorbed per gram of bone is slightly less than the energy absorbed per gram of muscle or fat. Now, although electron density is less, Bone, as you know, has a higher physical density at almost twice that of muscle or fat. And so we can say that the energy absorbed per volume of compact bone is almost twice that of the equal volume of fat or muscle, at least when exposed to x-rays or gamma rays of intermediate energy. All right, so let's quickly recap what we've learned. Hopefully now you see that the concept of x-ray attenuation is fundamental to understanding how x-rays interact with different materials, including human tissues. We talked about the basic principles of attenuation, the relevant formulae, and how the different tissues in the body affect x-ray attenuation. So hopefully now by understanding these interactions and effects on different tissues, you now have a better appreciation for what goes on behind the scenes next time you take an x-ray. That's it for this one. Thanks for sticking to the end and I hope you found the video useful. Again, I'll link down the textbook that I use so you can check that out for some more information. And I'll also link some other relevant videos that are related to this, which you can click here to watch those. So see you there and stay curious.